Hey, my name is Leah Marville. On paper, I've achieved many things that one would equate to success and even happiness. But I know all too well that we don't experience the peaks of our journeys without traveling through the valleys. Along my own journey, I have been inspired time and again by the way others traverse their own. Life for sure will give you lemons, and I believe our lemons turn out to be our greatest lessons and the guide to our purpose here on this earth. We each have a story that brings its own unique message into the world. This is the true value of the individual, the ability to view the world through a lens that has never belonged to anyone else. The goal here is to share the stories of incredible people in an attempt to inspire us all to tap into the vast potential we each possess. It is my hope that these stories will always remind us that it is indeed possible to create something beautiful and sweet from the seed of that which may seem impossibly sour. Because that is life. And this is Life and Lemonade. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Life and Lemonade TV. Of course, I'm your host, Leah Marvel, and today we are sitting with Quentin Thrash, a bespoke menswear designer from a small town in the middle of Georgia called Hawkinsville. Did <laughs> I get it? it? Yeah. Um, he grew up with a passion for athletics and had a brief college football career. He's also a licensed barber from the age of 19. And then he moved to Los Angeles and he started cutting hair for celebrities like French Montana, a Young Dolph, Trinidad James, Afrojack, and a whole lot more. He designs for music videos, TV shows, red carpets, of course, and he's making his stamp in Hollywood. And uh, he has a beautiful son. Yeah. I think father is also one of his amazing roles as well and we can talk about that but welcome to life and lemonade tv we always like to start at the beginning which is your childhood because we believe that your childhood shapes who you are so tell us about what life in hawkinsville georgia was like um so like you said hawkinsville is like a really small town so like, the population is only 4500 people Right. So it's one of those, people. yeah. So it's one of those places where like everybody knows everybody. Everybody's right. in everybody's business, or you you kin to everybody. You know right. what I mean? Everybody your cousin. Right. So um, growing up like that, it's like it's a very small community to where it's everything's very family oriented. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, I was raised very very strict just because it's also I mean, you have your ways of getting caught in the streets and stuff like that because in those small areas it isn't a lot of opportunity right so um luckily i had the gift of athleticism so um i, I played ball all day all night mm -hmm. you know what i mean i I, just, I remember um playing ball so late that my mom would come outside and put up like a little spotlight on the front porch to shine out in the driveway for like me and my friends to still play ball mm -hmm. because as long as we were playing ball we weren't getting in trouble right um but yeah, but I mean, that's really all it was. It really m wasn't much, much else to do besides that. You know what I mean? Like my dad was a mechanic. Mm -hmm. um, I never really took to getting into like the whole mechanics thing because honestly, he never really wanted me to. He mm -hmm. was like, you're, you're way too smart to have to do all this manual labor. Right. So mm -hmm. he, he, he let me just kind of take the sports route until I figured out what I really wanted to do in life. Right. Yeah. And so were your parents like focused on academics? What? Were they what is it that they expected from you or of you? Um... I don't know if they had it was anything specific to right. be honest um like neither one of my parents went to college right so me going to college was a really big deal mm -hmm. and especially the fact i went to um, college on a full scholarship because oh, wow. even academically i wasn't the greatest kid in the classroom i was very intelligent but i just couldn't focus on schoolwork. Right. Um, I was just too much of a creative. I was too too all over the place. Right. You know what I mean? Um, so what was the first area that you kind of picked up that you were creative? What was the first thing you did? Drawing. Okay. Yeah, so I used to love to draw. Um, I remember in high school, I wish to this day that I never threw it away. I used to have this folder where I used to draw like sneakers, like Air Force Ones and Jordans mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I, I would I, um, I draw, I'd draw the original one and I have my dad making me copies of it. So then I put them in this folder and every day I just be coloring shoes in different colorways that didn't exist that I wanted to exist. Oh, wow. And I was doing this in like ninth grade. And uh, to this day, it's like I, I remember some of those visually. I remember what some of those colorways were. And I'm like, bro, I was way before my time. Yeah. You know what I mean, this is like, what, 2004 or five, mm -hmm. something like that. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, I remember making plaid Air Force Ones and stuff like that. Like literally drawing plaid lines on shoes. Wow. And um, 
And at, at that time, I still didn't even know anything about designing shoes that mm -hmm. I could possibly be a designer for mm -hmm. a Nike or for whoever it may be. I, I never even knew this kind of stuff. I never knew that. I never thought about the concept of design. All I knew is you go to the mall, you buy clothes, you wear them. I never thought about where these clothes come from, right. why these clothes are made this way, why the fabric is this way. Because, right. um, you know what I'm saying, different, different fabrics um, are more prominent in different um, climates and things right. like that. Like, I never knew that. I just right. knew I'm, I want to wear with this rapper wearing on TV. Right. And, um, and your first attraction seemed to have been colors. More yeah, so my, yeah, my yeah. thing has always been colors. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I think a lot of it had to do with me being from the South um, and being inspired by a lot of like country club living and, mm -hmm. and Ralph Lauren and very American Ivy League stuff that I felt like I wasn't a part of, mm -hmm. but I wanted to be a part of. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So this was kind of my way of like kicking in that door like, oh, y'all ain't gonna let me in here? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna do it myself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's how that's how the whole prep style and stuff came about with me because I felt like I wasn't, I didn't belong there. So I'm, I'm gonna make my own way. You developed your career in your first expression really mm -hmm. in athleticism mm -hmm. you had a, a brief basketball mm -hmm. football i played i played basketball football, football. and i ran track yeah. right so your height was it because of your height or was it because of how did you find yourself in that space just growing up in the hood that's all that's all right. you got okay you know what i'm saying we we, we played basketball in dirt dr right. you know what i'm saying dirt lots so in the mm -hmm. backyard and with bald basketballs and just you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. like that's just kind of what we did to pass the time right. and eventually you get good at it and then right. once you once you get in middle school and high school you can finally play ball mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, for your high school and stuff like that mm -hmm. and like that's what the city or the, i can't say mine was the city of town that's what the town looks forward to mm -hmm. is high school football games mm -hmm. high school basketball games mm -hmm. so like that's your first chance of like being a celebrity Right. You know what I mean? It's like everybody, like, oh, I can't wait to see what you're going to do to them um, mm -hmm. this Friday night under, right. them, under, them, under the lights. Right. Uh, so that was like that first thing of like actually developing this persona of like being someone that people look up to. Right. Like I remember being in high school and there'd be like kids, like be like, be like the little brothers of like other students, but they're like in the elementary school. So like they come to the high school basketball games mm -hmm. and I was a big like dunker. So I was, I was like a really high jumper. Mm -hmm. So I was the person always dunking in the games and stuff like that. And um, my nickname was Superman because of that, because they say I fly, I didn't jump. Mm -hmm. And that's when I first started having like little fans. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like, all these little elementary school kids, Superman, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do today? Like, you know what I mean? So yeah. it was crazy. Uh, but yeah, that's where it all began um, when you're young is just playing sports. Mm -hmm. um, going to high school, going, like going to middle school, then going to high school, then you just kind of develop this, you know what I'm saying, this persona. Right. Um, so then at that age, what did you think you were going to become? You just th you think you're going to go to the, to the yeah. NBA or the NFL. Okay. For me, it's the NFL because that, that's what I ended up going to college for was football. Right. So, um, yeah, I thought I was going to the NFL. Right. So my, the reason I say my, my college career ended short because I got kicked out my sophomore year. Okay. And literally, I was 19 years old and all I knew was sports. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when I got kicked out of school and it was so abrupt, mm -hmm. I didn't know what to do. I was like, what do, like, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to be the statistic of the little kid with all this talent who is lucky enough to go to college and then has to go back home and live in his parents' house. Right, so okay. I, so I refused to be that kid. Right. So I told my dad, I was like, I'm not coming home. Went back to Charleston and I told my dad, I was like, I ain't coming home. Like, I'm gonna figure it out. I'm, mm -hmm. gonna, I'm gonna do something. Mm -hmm. And mind you, I had been cutting hair because I started cutting hair in high school. Mm. Um, and I was just like, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but as long as I lo know how to cut hair, I'm at least gonna try to be a barber. Mm -hmm. So I started cutting hair and I went to, I got, I finally got in um, a barber shop. And that's when I was like, oh snap, I'm really, I'm really, I'm really talented. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not just my friends now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like the city, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, rocks with me on, on mm -hmm. cutting hair. From there, I started dreaming bigger. From there, I started, I'm watching TV, I'm watching uh, music videos and stuff, and I'm like, whoever's cutting Jay-Z's hair, whoever cutting Diddy's hair, I know they ain't getting $12 for a haircut like I was right. getting. Right. And so that's when I was just like, the only way to get there is to position myself where that type of people exist. What drew you to, to LA? How did that So not start? even. Uh, mm -hmm. Honestly, I was just given an opportunity to move to LA. I never okay. thought about moving to LA. Right. I was 22 years old thinking that LA was like something that you saw on TV. Okay. I didn't think that it was possible to really move to LA. <laughs> and um, 
I was talking to this um, to this chick at the time who was about to move out here because she was in the military, mm-hmm. and uh, she was just like, "Thrash, you've outgrown Charleston. Like you've done everything you can do." She's like, "Why you just don't move to LA?" She like, "You can crash with me till you figure out what you want to do, mm-hmm. get on your feet." And I was like, "You know what? I ain't got nothing holding me back. Mm-hmm. At the time, I ain't have no kid. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll, I work for myself. As long as I had my Clippers, I knew I can I can make some money." Mm-hmm. So, um, and by that time, I had started getting into other things. I had started modeling. Mm-hmm. Um, people were pushing me to be a stylist, which I didn't know anything about styling, but people used to always tell me, oh, you should be a stylist just because I dress well. Right. Okay. But yeah, so like, the LA thing was just like, it was given, I was given an opportunity. Two weeks later, I was on my first ever flight. That was the first time I ever was on an airplane when I was 22 years old when I moved to LA. Oh, wow. Curious. Where did you learn to dress? Because at this point, people are telling you you should be a stylist. But where did you pick that up? Is it? I don't know. Anyone was, in your family like was? Nah. Was well, stylish? so my uncle, my uncle used to be a big drug dealer, right? And <laughs> he, he just said that just like it just rolled off. Yeah, your I mean, it, what it is, what it is. <laughs> okay. So, but he, like he don't, he he don't do it no more. So right, okay. I can talk we can talk about it now. <laughs> but uh, so he used to be a big drug dealer, and so he always had money. So whenever mm-hmm. he go out, he never wore the same thing twice. So he had every pair of Jordans you could imagine, you know right. what I mean? And now that I was getting older, we ain't here wore the same size shoe. Mm. So whenever he wear a pair of shoes, I knew he wasn't gonna wear it again, so I'd take them. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that's kind of where maybe a little bit of it came from. It I just saw things that I thought was interesting um, that other people may have um, looked down on or thought was corny or nerdy. I was like, no, I'm gonna show you how to make this corny thing cool. Right. And that's, what, that's literally to this day what my style is right. all about. Yeah. It's making the things that are typically looked at, looked down upon. It's like showing you, like, no, it can be done in a cool way. You just gotta, you just gotta do it and own it. Yeah. Essentially, so you moved to LA, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and this is the thing, you know, coming from a small town or even like me, I come from a small country. The idea that you can move to LA is like this, like you said, it's something you see on TV. It's just a place on TV, but mm-hmm. you don't ever think that you can get there and live there and mm-hmm. like be somebody, mm-hmm. right? But you take the leap, you know, a lot of times dreamers take the leap and they come to LA and they think it's going to be just like, well, red carpet roll out because it's very sunny, it's palm trees, like life really can't be that hard, right? Mm-hmm. So what was that like, your first <laughs> your first couple of wow. years in LA? To be honest, I lived on couches for like five years. Five years. Before I actually got in an apartment with my name on the lease. And I really didn't even notice it. Mm -hmm. One day it just took me like my back hurting and me looking up like, hold up, I've been sleeping on a couch for years at this point because I was just so focused and grinding and working Mm -hmm. hard that like my comfortability at home wasn't a priority. Right. It's like I'm up and down, I'm up in the morning, I'm moving, I don't sit down, you Mm -hmm. know what I mean, until it's time to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And I'm still like that to this day now. Mm -hmm. Like when I wake up in the morning, I'm on the go. From Mm -hmm. the time my feet touch the ground, I'm on the go. Mm-hmm. And um, so anyone that knew me personally, they knew what my living situation was like. But like anybody outside, you would never know it because I dress well, I carry myself well. Right. You know I mean, I can articulate myself. Right. Um, even the people I surround myself with, I surround myself with um, other successful people and creatives. Right. So no one ever expected me to be living in a living room, sleeping on a couch. Um, mm-hmm. um, but so at this point in time, you're cutting hair. This is how you're hustling. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to cut hair. I'm, uh, I'm trying to get in different barbershops out here in L.A., right. but it's very different, of course. Right. They charge me a lot more money for booth rent. Right. I don't have any clientele, so it's like y'all still charging me $200 a week when I don't have any clients. Mm-hmm. Like, that's crazy. So I was bouncing around different shops, um, cutting different people's hair from, uh, from wherever I was living at in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Things like that. Um, I started getting into the styling world. I actually just, I'm, I'm not saying through networking, I met some people mm-hmm. who allowed me to like assist them on, um, on certain styling jobs. Mm-hmm. So that's how I was able to start learning the industry mm-hmm. and learning how to move on set and move mm-hmm. around celebrities and things like that. So what was, the, what was the moment in time where it went from just like hustling to an opportunity that was like, oh my gosh. Like, it's, I feel like it never was that, right? Mm-hmm. So I talked to people about how in LA people see you have these successes and they think that you're you've made it and it's like no there's a lot of little successes that might not add up to what you what your expectations are so it's like yeah I may have cut French Montana's hair but how long is that 
hundred dollar haircut gonna last me. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Like so people so they, they think because I cut French Montana hair that I'm rich all of a sudden. Right. You know what I mean? So uh I guess you get the notion that okay, French Montana leads to somebody else. Yeah. But it, it's not it's not instant the right. way uh people would think it will it, it, right. it would be. But um so yeah, I I've, I've had a lot of like small um uh successes here and there, but like nothing that was stable. Right. So I think the biggest thing with uh, being a creative, being an artist, is getting to that place to where whatever you do um, for a living, once it becomes a consistent and stable thing. Right. So that was my biggest thing. It took me five years to where everything that I was doing, everything that people seen me do or know mm -hmm. me for doing, became consistent. Mm -hmm. So, which was what? How were you making your money four or five years before you got that leap? I was, I was still, cu I was still cutting hair. I was right. doing little small styling gigs on the side. Mm -hmm. Like I said, my my overhead was low. Right. So. A lot of times I was broke. <laughs> like people don't know I was broke, bro. I remember I remember calling one of my homeboys one time, and I was like, bro, because I knew he had food stamps. Right. And I called him. I was like, hey, bro, I'm gonna be real with you. I need you to come scoop me and take me to the uh, to the grocery store. I just want to go grab like some bread, some sandwich meat. You know right. what I'm saying? Some mayonnaise, mustard, whatever. <laughs> right. Just so I can make some some sandwiches around the crib, cause like, bro, I think I had like two dollars in my um, mm -hmm. I think I had two dollars in my name at that time. And, but the craziest thing is about being a creative, the next day could be so different for you. Mm -hmm. Like I remember sitting in a barbershop cutting hair and then I got a DM from AJ Green, who's one of my homies that, um, he was from South Carolina, mm -hmm. but he had just went to the NFL, signed this huge contract, whatever. So he had a lot of stuff going on and I'm sitting in a barbershop and I get a DM from him. Well, it wasn't a DM, it was whatever uh, messages on Twitter back in the day, this is before mm -hmm. Instagram. Right. And he messaged me and he was like, Hey bro, I got some uh some stuff I gotta do in Vegas. I want you to put together some looks for me. My first styling job ever. Wow. I'm like, oh okay. I'm like, um, like what's your what's your budget? Like, what, what type of money you got to spend? He told me ten thousand dollars. I ain't never seen ten thousand dollars in my life. <laughs> so that was his budget. So off of that, I made like three grand, right? Because at that time you wouldn't know how to price something. Yeah, like I didn't know. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I was just asking him. He was like, uh, he told me he had ten grand. No, I charged a percentage of that, so that's why I made three grand off of it. Right. And literally, that money, that three thousand dollars, was gone in like a week for me trying to catch up on stuff that I was backed up on. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like you see these successes, but they don't add up to what you really think they are. Yeah. Yeah. It's like what they say: it's like ten years of building, of grinding, of hustling before this overnight success, if that mm -hmm. ever yeah. pans out if to be ever, that. Yeah. And as a creative, as you say, you, li you live in this dream that tomorrow is going to be different. Yeah. And that's kind of what gets you through today. Yeah. Where do you think, like, how does Hopkinsville play a role in your, like, how you live your day-to-day -day life in LA? Oh, major. I mean, everybody that knows <laughs> me knows. He unfold his foot. <laughs> yeah, like, everybody that knows me knows that I'm, like, unforgivably thrashed. Like, right. I'm, I'm, I'm as southern as it gets. Right. You know what I mean? And, and, I, and I love it. Yeah. And if you don't like it, you ain't got to you ain't got to rock with it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, I I'm, I love being from where I'm from. Right. I feel like it made me it made me who I am. Like the type of values and morals that I have mm -hmm. all come from me being from the south. Mm -hmm. um, Which is like what? So tell me a little bit about that. Just I mean uh, the respect that we have for people. You know what I mean the way we uh, the way we the way we deal with people, the way we care, mm -hmm. um, the hustle that we have because we come from nothing. You know what I mean? So we have to we have to create everything. People always ask me about like being from the South, like is it is it racist? And I remember I had to sit back and think about it one day. I was like, you know what? I never really thought about how much racism stuff I probably dealt with because it's all I knew. Right. You know what I mean? It was it was just so swept under the rug a lot of times, mm -hmm. just because I didn't know anything else. I didn't know what it was like to live on the West Coast. I didn't know what it was like up north. Mm -hmm. All I knew was the South. I had never been anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, but I appreciate it. I love it. You know what I mean? It's 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 part of who I am. It's part of the DNA of you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. who I am. But even my son, like I still eventually want to take him back and raise him in the South because right. it's just a it's it's just a different thing. I don't, I don't know how I don't know how many people you know from the South, but like people from the South are just a little bit different. They just I, I can't even put put it in words. I can't That's put it in words. I don't know many people from the South, but I always think, and this might be naive for me, so please forgive me. Do not come for me. But I always think that people from the South are close to like people from the islands. I, yeah, I don't definitely. know, it's, there's a similarity and a humanness that seems just a yeah. little more relatable. I remember when I moved to Charleston, um, 
they speak Geechee. Geechee Gullah Geechee, yeah. yeah. Gullah Geechee, yeah. And it's literally in Charleston. Mm-hmm. You go 30 minutes to, you go to Columbia, they don't talk like that. You go to uh, anywhere else in Charleston, they don't talk like that. It's only in Charleston. Mm-hmm. And I remember when I first came to Charleston, I was like, bro, why do you folks talk like that? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I'm like, it felt like because the the way that they uh, the way that they word things is like very kind of like broken English kind of, yeah, yeah. and I'm like, bro, y'all y'all just why y'all can't talk right? Like yeah. that word doesn't go there, and this me coming from my, my country right. itself coming from Georgia, right. and it took me a couple of years until I learned that the Gullah Geechee language is literally considered its own language. Mm-hmm. It's not just them. Uh, not using words correctly right. and, no, it's, and a, it's a an actual dialect or yeah. language that they, yeah. they speak and i thought that was so interesting once i learned mm-hmm. that but it took me learning that to really appreciate it yeah you know what i mean and i think historically Gullah Geechee people originally came to the u.s through as slaves of course yeah um and they formed their own community but it's actually pretty fascinating yeah it is like i even even now since i haven't been in charleston in nine years i still follow certain accounts just because i still like to hear them talk you know i mean i I still like to hear it and they're so very strong in their culture too as a people yeah and and that's what you appreciate about the south because like for me being able to travel now i realize like a lot of places don't really have much culture Culture. yeah like i remember being a kid in elementary school we used to literally go on field trips to plantations mm-hmm. you know what i mean so like the stuff that ki- other kids around the um around the world are learning in in history books mm-hmm. like no i learned that firsthand mm-hmm. like i was there mm-hmm. like a lot of the stuff in this history books like i live here you know what I'm saying? i live where a lot of stuff this stuff happened like in macon georgia where uh all this stuff with um uh martin luther king and uh the temptations and all this kind of stuff right. like a lot of stuff was where i'm from right you know what i mean yeah. so what is Thrash's style? Uh, well, I deem the term the Satorial rock star. Right. So, uh, for people that don't know what a Satorialist yeah. is, a Satorialist is a person who uses a tailor for their clothing. Mm-hmm. But typically, when you think of a, um, a Satorialist, you think of someone very white collar. You think of bankers. You think of Wall right. Street. You think mm-hmm. of you know what I mean people who work office jobs, things like that. Um, but I'm like, just because I wear a suit doesn't mean I have to be bland. It doesn't mean I have to be dry and mm-hmm. don't know and have no personality. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why I chose the term the Satorial rock star because my personality is very rock starish compared mm-hmm. to is very contradictive to the way that I dress, mm-hmm. and that's one thing that I'm really um, that I really love is duality. Mm-hmm. I love being able to to teeter that line of multiple worlds. Yeah. Yeah. Do you I, have a signature style? So I believe in living bold. Right. So just be who you want to be. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, so that's why I wear a lot of colors. I wear a lot of patterns. Uh, I'm still influenced by a lot of other cultures. So whether it's Scottish, with that's why I love wearing a lot of plaids mm-hmm. and tartans and things. Mm-hmm. Um, African colorways, I'm infatuated with. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, but even like the American style, like the whole Ivy League prep. Ralph Lauren is my favorite designer. Mm-hmm. That's why you see me wear a lot of Ralph Lauren polos, and I, I wear a lot of like short chino shorts during the mm-hmm. summer, and uh, I wear gray New Balance because mm-hmm. that's what I was talking about—that whole like uh, country club vibe. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I, I love all that kind of stuff. But I'm but I'm doing that, and I got dreads and tattoos yeah. and gold teeth. Yeah. You know what I mean? So and, 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 it doesn't, and it doesn't feel forced. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you're literally mixing mm-hmm. worlds. Yep, I'm mixing all these worlds to create who I am. Right. Because not one not one person on this earth is the same exact person. Mm-hmm. So it's like. I may have a twin, but we still may have different tastes and different things. Mm-hmm. So it's like mixing those things together is what's going to create you. Mm-hmm. So thrash, I come from, I like edgy stuff. I like rocker stuff. So you see me wearing my biker jacket all the time. Right. But also, you also might catch me with a sweater tie around my neck. Right. But then you also might catch me in a three-piece, you know what I'm saying, suit with yeah. a bow tie on. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So all of those things are all thrash. Mm-hmm. And one thing that really um, spelled that out to me was I was watching something about Ralph Lauren. And he was explaining how with when it comes to brands, you have to explain what that guy looks like. So basically, what does a Ralph Lauren guy look like right. when he's in a formal event? What does he look like when he's at the beach? Right. What does he look like when he's in a casual setting? Right. What does he look like when he goes to a wedding? What does he look like when he goes to a funeral? Mm-hmm. So all but you like with the Ralph Lauren guy, you can if you see that guy, you know who that guy is, right. even though he's in all these different settings dressed totally different. You all, they all still have that same energy though. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing that I'm really, um, uh, really interested in diving more into is because I just got into home decor now. 
So when you walk into my apartment, it feels like thrash. Like this is what you expect. So tell right? me, what what do we see now? You're in your home decor. Like so what? I have a lot of Persian rugs. I have mm -hmm. floral wallpapers. Yeah. I have two tone plaid drapes. I have vintage wooden wooden desks and uh, lots of plants. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Just all these different things that uh, that I've that I've liked over time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you like stuff and you don't even know why you like it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like I just dive into it now. If, it, if 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 I don't shut it down completely in my mind, I take I take time to like, okay, what do I like about this? Because I don't hate it, right. but I don't love it. So it's some so something's there. Right. Okay. So I take time to just cultivate it and see kind of see what it is. Like, what do I really like about this? Okay, I like the way this fabric moves, mm -hmm. but I like the way the colors of this looks. So for example, um, with African textiles, right? Mm -hmm. With kentes. Mm -hmm. I'm not crazy about the texture of kente though, mm -hmm. but I love the patterns. I love the colors. Right. So if I can mix that with a different type of material, if I can mix that with a wool, that makes that feel kente like thrash. In a wool. Okay. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how, um, how I approach a lot of things. Even, even with my car, my seats are made by me. Yeah, guys, if you see his car, yeah. it's, it gets dope. Yeah, like and, that. that's, and that's, that's even another thing to even attest to what I'm saying is right. about the lifestyle. Think about the rest of my life. Like, what do you expect the rest of Thrash's life to look like? What type of right. car do you see Thrash driving? Right. What type right. of apartment do you see Thrash living in? Right. What type of office do you see him having? Right. You know what I mean? Um, to me, I, I, you know, like, and you're right, which is, which is what I open this with, is that when you, when you see someone dressed so boldly, you know there's an identity and a mm -hmm. story behind them. And I say on Life and Lemonade all the time, what you do in one area of your life, you kind of do in all, it, it spills mm -hmm. over. I like, to, I like to make things cool. Yeah. The things that aren't typically cool, like a man having pink wallpaper in his apartment, that, yes. that, isn't, that isn't a, a masculine thing. Right. But says who? Right. I say it is. So I'm going to have pink floral wallpaper in my apartment. You know what I mean? And that's going to allow some other little kid who's afraid to be him to not be afraid to step off that ledge and be like, you know what? I right. do like this. Right. The youth, they look up to us. Right. And we're, you know what I'm saying? Our kids are going to be looking up to them. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like, we got to keep pushing the envelope and keep pushing the culture forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And are you self-taught or is this all just internal? Majority, well, I wouldn't say I'm completely self-taught, mm -hmm. but I'm very um, conscious of keeping people around me who are great at things that they do. So all of my friends, all of my associates, if it's something that I don't know how to do, they know how to do it and I can learn from them. Right. So basically I associate myself with people I can always learn from. But right. this type of work that you do is really intricate. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the designing of, I mean, we have, we design in, in the Caribbean and I always relate it back to the Caribbean because this is what I know and this is where I'm from, right? Mm -hmm. We wake up and we go to a seamstress and we're like, okay, we draw something on a piece of paper and we're like, can you make that? Mm -hmm. And she just kind of makes it into anything, but it doesn't come with patterns, it doesn't. And a lot of designers in the Caribbean don't grow up learning all the technicalities no. of fashion. Yeah, so, so yeah, with you saying yeah. that, no. Like, I didn't go to right. fashion school. Right. Like, I, don't, I didn't do nothing. I, I, I know basic sewing skills. Right. But as a businessman, I knew where I wanted to be at. I knew mm -hmm. the quality where I wanted to rest at. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm thir well, at that time I was like 30 years old, right? Right. And my tailor's been sewing over 30 years. Mm -hmm. Why would I sit here trying to figure this stuff out and coming up with subpar products until, I'm, until I get to that point mm -hmm. when I can just employ someone who does this for a living? Mm -hmm. So I focus on what I'm great at, which mm -hmm. is design. Mm -hmm. They focus on what, they, what they're great at and what they on the only thing they want to do. Mm -hmm. My tailors, they only want to sew clothes. They don't want to design. Right. They don't want to do right. patterns. My mm -hmm. pattern maker wants to do patterns. Right. My sewers, they want to sew. Mm -hmm. I want to design. Mm -hmm. And I just build a team of everybody who's great at what they do. Mm -hmm. And that's how I've become the most successful with that. Are you yeah. happy with where you're at now? Yeah, I'm, I'm ecstatic you're about years, where I'm at. Yeah. yeah, you're nine years into living in LA. I'm nine years into living in LA. I'm, to the level that I operate at now, I'm literally only like two years into the design world. Because right. I was styling for forever. Mm -hmm. I was styling the whole time. I wasn't designing. Right. So even, even that's a, um, a part of my, my journey. Because I fought being a designer for a long time because I felt like when... I see people design things and they're designing these crazy avant-garde things. It's like, my brain doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. So that never attracted me to being a designer. Right. And then when I started realizing like, no, I can just take very traditional things that I like and put my spin on it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's mm -hmm. when I take something, 
you take a typical person in a in a navy suit and a white shirt, and it's like, oh no, how would you throw a, sla- a splash of plaid on there instead mm-hmm. of that white shirt? Let's do a pink shirt mm-hmm. just to give it a little flavor. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Instead of doing a necktie, let's do a bow tie. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So like all those little things, I was like, okay, so I'm I'll start noticing people really like the way I put things together. So I might as well design it the way that I put these things mm-hmm. together because I originally started out thrifting because of course I couldn't afford to be having custom suits made um, back in the day, so. I was going to thrift stores, buying these suits, taking them to the tailor, getting them tailored, and everybody thought that my stuff was custom because of how it fit. And that's the, the um, same fun that I'm having now with the home decor stuff. Mm-hmm. Like my pillows look exactly like my suits. I love mm-hmm. it. So what do you think that, because I asked you a lot about your background, right? A lot mm-hmm. about Hopkinsville. Um, but how do you think fashion and Hollywood has contributed to who you are now? Fashion and Hollywood. Um, I mean, like I said, I'm very true to myself, so I, I'm not easily influenced. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but what I will say is, through being around a lot of successful people, um, I started realizing, like, okay, if I dress a certain way, I'm perceived a certain way. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So you're able to be accepted in different rooms mm-hmm. by the way you dress. Yes. Yes. It helped me polish myself up and really mature my style. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, I'm definitely still bolder than the average. You know what right. I mean? Right. So yeah. I, exactly. You are bolder than the average, and I think that that's innate to you. But what would you? How would you advise someone who has this like kind of fire within themselves, but they don't know how to do that? Like, what would you tell them? I would tell them to be curious about everything. Right. Be curious. Mm-hmm. Um. And and find out. Cause like I said earlier, I started seeing these things that I liked and that I didn't like. And I was like, well, let me see how can I, how can I go all the way and make this make this me. Mm-hmm. So yeah, just just try everything because you never know. There's some things that you may not think that you're into, but once you actually try it, mm-hmm. you'd be like, oh, I actually like this. This mm-hmm. is this is cool. And um, you you actually may end up being involved with something that you could have never seen yourself being involved in. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause there's a lot of things. I've definitely coming from the south. Like I was definitely very closed minded to a lot of things mm-hmm. growing up, just like everyone else was. Um, I just was a little bit, I, I was a little bit more assertive than other people, but I still had that in me as well. Right. And as I started just like allowing myself to be open to things, I was like, hold up, I do like this. Mm-hmm. Or, oh, this, this ain't as weird as I thought it was. Mm-hmm. Or, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I found myself into different things. Like aside from like, I grew up playing basketball, football, running track. Now I'm shooting pool, I'm bowling, right. I'm rock climbing. You know, right. I'm doing things that I was never exposed to when I was young. As a matter of fact, I, I, I love speaking on that. I, I read this, um, I watched this interview one time, and this guy was talking about how, like, young kids from, the, from like, the inner city or um, urban, urban situations, how they grow up a lot of times thinking that they aren't good at anything right. or, or they don't have any talents. Right. And what it really could also be is that whatever your true passion or whatever your true calling is, what if that person just has never been exposed to exposed it? To it? Mm-hmm. Like, what if this little kid from the hood is supposed to be this huge tennis player, but no one's ever put a tennis racket in his hand? Right. So he's, he grows up his whole life thinking that he, he isn't good at anything, it. and he just he hasn't been exposed to it. Mm-hmm. So that's why I think it's so important to just try everything. Um, you have a son. Mm-hmm. How old is he? He'll be four in April. Yes. Yeah, birthday coming up. He definitely <laughs> let me know it. I see you dress him already. He like has his, yeah. has a vibe. Yeah. He um we actually had a parent teacher conference the other day, and my son. So his school is supposed to wear uniforms. Right. But because of COVID, a lot of the parents kind of been lazy with like making sure the kids wear their uniforms and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. man, we're me and his mom like we're pretty on it. Like make sure we abide by the rules. So he wears his uniform every day. So he's got to the point where he's kind of like, Dad, like, why can't I wear the stuff that I want to wear? And right. no one else is wearing right. uniforms, pretty much. And mind you, my son is like three, almost four, but he's very advanced. Right. So um, he picks up on this kind of stuff. So like that right there even just shows me like he's he's already he already knows Observe what's going it. on. Like yeah. he, he wants to express himself. Mm-hmm. Um, he's very he always complimented me on my clothes. Every time he walks in the house, Dad, I like your shoes. Mm-hmm. Dad, I like your shirt. Mm-hmm. Like he's 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 all about it, man. And I'm just so excited to see what he ends up. You know what I'm saying, kind of attached. Tell me to you the importance of the role of being a father. Uh, uh it's very important because 
I see parenting as an opportunity to try to create the perfect human being. Okay. And so whether that's taking things that are adopted from the way that the father was raised and the way that the mother was raised, because you know everybody's raised differently, especially people who come from totally different you know what I'm places. And so there's certain things about the way that my son's mom was raised that I was like, you know what? That's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. I wish I, I wish I was raised that way. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. There's certain things that I don't necessarily agree with mm-hmm. and vice versa. Mm-hmm. So it's like taking all these different things and, put, and putting the ones that we think are the best um, components to try to create this perfect little person mm-hmm. to be the best human being that he can be. So like that's the, that's the fun part of parenting to me. Mm-hmm. It's like I'm literally, I literally have a blank slate right here and I'm trying to make him the most impactful person on this earth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why do you think that is important? Um, I think it's important because everybody's not that fortunate to to be blessed to have um, to have parents like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a parent teacher conference at this school the other day, and they were explaining how some of the because you know when kids go to school, they start adopting other things from other kids, right. and and they were like, "Your son is so blessed because he actually has two parents that care." A lot of his friends that are in his school don't necessarily have that same thing. You know what I'm saying my son could be the reason another little kid who may not have a father, he may be able to help him in certain areas because he does have a dad who teaches mm-hmm. him certain things. Mm-hmm. So he may be able to afford that information over to you know what I'm another kid who doesn't have that kind of aspect in their life. Mm-hmm. So I want to give you three words and you can tell me what comes to mind when you think of it, right? Gotcha. First thing that comes to mind with identity. Identity is who you naturally are. Right. Um, not who you want to be or not who people perceive you as, but who you actually are supposed to be. Mm-hmm. What comes to mind when you hear the word uh, style? Style. Mm-hmm. First thing that comes to mind when I think of style, I think of I think of how everyone everyone has a style. Okay. It may not necessarily be a good style, right. but everyone has their style. Right. Like my dad has terrible style oh, dear. but he has a very he has a very direct thing like when he goes to the store he goes for the exact same things every time and that right there shows you that he has a style he has a type mm-hmm. people just may not care for it but mm-hmm. he's gonna wear the same types of things all the time and that's what makes him him just how everyone has a style mm-hmm. and um how style can also do a lot of the talking for you before you even have to open your own mouth mm-hmm. um like I said, people assume that people who dress well or have great style um, are educated, are mm-hmm. successful, things like that. Confidence. So, <laughs> confidence. Yeah. When I think of confidence, I think of how a lot of people, a lot of people are born with confidence, but not everybody. Right. But it's something that can definitely be learned. Yeah. Yeah, some people just naturally just kind of have it. Yeah. Some people, given their circumstances, you know, everyone yeah. doesn't doesn't have Life that same. Life might beat you down or something. Yeah. 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 But, but it can it can definitely. That you can get it back. You can find it. Yeah, you yeah. can definitely find it back. If you give yourself permission, for sure, I feel that way. What are you um, most proud of at this moment in your life? I'm most proud of being able to accomplish. Um, a lot of the things that I set out for myself mm-hmm. um, and knowing that I'm influencing and affecting others to do the same because mm-hmm. at the end of the day my biggest thing is spreading the game spreading the knowledge mm-hmm. I feel like that's like the, the, the next level of everything is once you've mastered something mm-hmm. the next part is to educate it and pass it on right. um, yeah. so, yeah. mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm blessed that I'm in a place to where now I can start influencing other people to kind of be who they want to be. I think part of our entire purpose here on earth is to give back mm-hmm. whatever it is that we're blessed with, whether that's information, mm-hmm. resources, talent, a way, an opportunity, you know? Yeah. So I like that you say that. What, what would you want to be remembered for? What would I want to be remembered for? That's a good mm-hmm. question. What do I want to be remembered for? I want to be remembered for changing the narrative of how young black kids are looked at. Because I remember the days when I'd walk into an establishment and I would just look at this little black kid who 
like why are you even in here mm -hmm. and then i remember i went i never forget, I, I walked in a ralph lauren store mm -hmm. and i was i was dressed up because i had just come from somewhere i had on like a dress shirt and some slacks and a tie and just, it was a lot more like of a warm welcome mm -hmm. and i was like dang the way that i dress really like like you know how they say don't judge a book by its cover but right. subconsciously everybody does yeah. i, I want to be remembered for being that person to show like other other black kids that it's okay to be who you are yeah. who you want to be you know what i mean yeah. and that's and, and that's not even saying that i want people to be like me right i want you to be like you right. and not be afraid to be who you are mm -hmm. what is what is the most important lesson you think that your life has tried to teach you i think that there i think one thing that my life has taught me that there is no one path mm, i like that because i've dealt with my fair share of hiccups and road and speed bumps and mm -hmm. things like that i've dealt with my fair share of them but all i did was pivot and make the make the best out of whatever the, the next direction i was going in mm -hmm. yeah Pivot. Pivot is my middle name. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I have a, a therapist, which I talk about, and she um, she broke that down to me. Like she was asking me, "What do I think my superpower is?" And I was like, "I couldn't find what my superpower was." And so she was like, "Well, tell me about about your life." So I gave her my life story, and she was like, "Your superpower is adaptability, mm. the ability to pivot." And I had never seen it as a a superpower but it is it, yeah, is. it is it's understanding like you said there's no one path mm -hmm. to life just figure it out get creative there's another way what what uh, is something about you that only people who live with you like a quirk something that only someone who lives with you would know yeah so one thing about me that a lot of people will tell you i always have like dental floss or like the little toothpick thing always so like right now i have one in my pocket like i always have one like even if i'm like laying around the house in like gym shorts i have it in my pocket so we like, could come to you for bespoke suits decor and dental floss and dental floss yep. right, guys. well no you it's, 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 in the world with dental yeah. floss Wait. that is a quirk for sure let me see oh my gosh i always have one so what are you excited about mm -hmm. what i'm excited about I feel like right now, this exact moment, I'm most excited about my new journey with my home decor. Mm -hmm. Like, I literally get excited to make pillows just as, just as much as I do to make suits. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just one of those things where I felt like I wasn't supposed to be doing this. Like, this mm -hmm. isn't something that a, a young black kid does. Mm -hmm. So, like, now that I'm doing it and, like, people love it. Like, every time someone walks into my place, I still haven't launched it yet. So, right. you come to my place, it's the only place you see them. Right. And, like, people just ask me, they're like, man, where you get these drapes from? I'm like... They actually mine, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's just such a, such a weird kind of like empowerment of, right. it, yeah, this is mine and you would never expect it. Right, yeah. right. I think that's dope. I wish I you all the best on that journey as thank, well. Thank you very much. So before we finna wrap out, right? <laughs> <laughs> you tried. Wait, do, well, what does finna mean? I mean, it's, I forget. So I just, it's, it's, a, it's a smashed up, Mm -hmm. word for fixing to okay so i'm finna go to the store i'm fixing to go to oh, the store I'm or i'm about to. to go to the store yeah all right so give me all right as we about to wrap this up right mm -hmm. give some hardcore advice to your younger self who is in hawksville hawksville who Hawks. yeah hardcore advice yeah in a full throw down Southern accent. Hey, little bruh. Just realize that whatever it is that you want to do, bruh, you can do it. Like, you see, I came from these same streets that you came from. You seen that I came, I done, I, you see you, you see all the stuff I've done. Like, when I when I was your age, you, you, know, you know way more than I did because I didn't have social media, so I wasn't able to be able to go and see all the things that you've been able to see from the internet. Like, we ain't had that back when I was here. I'm, I'm really envisioning like I'm talking to my little brother. Yeah. The street, like the street, like that street stuff just don't, just, it don't really get you nowhere because 
it's really you prove you you're not really proving nothing. You know what I mean? Not really proving nothing by by the street life. Cause at the same time, I'm still respected the same way as I was back when I was living there. I'm still respected the same. It's just the fact that uh, I was I wasn't afraid to step out and do some of my own. It's like there's a there's some badassness that comes with that alone. You know what I mean? Cause them same street dudes who still in the uh, who still in the hood doing all that crazy stuff. They look up to me because they was like, bro, you really, you really weren't afraid, you know what I'm saying, go out there and do your thing. You know what I mean? So, because, I mean, as, as, they're, as they're adults now, they know that they could have went and did whatever they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But the, the comfortability, the, the, uh, the unfamiliarity, unfamiliarity mm -hmm. like a majority of my family won't even go to Atlanta because Atlanta too big of a city for them. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it's like that. Mm. It's like you may know that you can do it, mm -hmm. but it's like uh, I ain't never did it before though, so I ain't finna, mm -hmm. I ain't finna stir the pot right now. Mm. But I think that that's I think that that's amazing advice, and I think it's always important that um, those of us who have ventured beyond the shores of where we we live, um, that we speak to those who are still there, that mm -hmm. we give them hope and we give them possibility. Mm -hmm. You know, because you figured it out. And it wasn't no, it was no red carpet. Five years, and then eventually it fell into place. And it's not going to be easy, but you can actually do it. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, I'm finna take that with me. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate your time and sitting here uh, with us. Um, I think you're an inspiration. I think um, you know, just not, just not. To, to people from where you're from, but to everybody who wants to be bold. It, yeah. it, sometimes it, it just doesn't seem, it's just not as easy for everyone to, to stand up and stand out, mm -hmm. you know? Um, one thing I will say is like, even some of the things that I, that I do in life, I literally do it to show people that it can be done. Right. You know what I mean? So like the fact that I authored a book, I've done a lot of things, right. you know what I mean? And I've literally done these things just to be able to say a little right. black kid did this. And that, that book entails stories talking about all of this right. stuff. It's talking mm -hmm. about me growing up and the things that, I, that yes. it took to develop my style and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I did that just to show people that, bro, like, hold up. Somebody from down the street, well, you know what I'm saying, that lived that door to my grandma, mm -hmm. he, got a, he got his own book. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's such a small thing, but it can be so monumental to certain people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's literally why I made that book. That's dope. I made that book so that people like, well, I know somebody that got it, got their own book. But no, it's dope, and um, you know, more people should tell their story. Mm -hmm. You know, it's important. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for having telling me. your story. All the best to you. Uh, like I Thanks said, Crush is an inspiration, and I think that you know. There's something in there, there's something in his story there's that that you can relate to, you know, in some way. You may not be from Georgia or you may not be from Hawksville. You probably don't even know how to use Finna, but you, <laughs> there is something here that you can relate to. Um.